in Real this evening, which is probably the penultimate program for the year. We have the former Speaker of the National Assembly, a senior counsel, uh, former politician, newspaper columnist, commentator, and so many other things. Mr. Ralph Ramkran. Mr. Ramkran, thank you for joining me and play yeah, Thank you for having me. You became speaker from in 2001 to 2012. That would have straddled the presidency of Barajagdu, is that correct? That's correct, yes. What are some of the notable experiences you had as speaker outside of the National Assembly and then inside of the National Assembly? Well, outside of the National Assembly, I, well, this was mainly overseas, not in Guyana. Guyana had the opportunity during my terms of office to be a member of the executive of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. Yes. Uh, you uh, go according to um, an alphabetical order. So we, um, we were a member of the executive for, for quite a while. And then we became a member of the executive of the Commonwealth Speakers Association. Mm -hmm. So I represented Guyana at these meetings and it was a great opportunity to meet um, other speakers from the Commonwealth and to exchange experiences. And inside of the National Assembly? Inside of the National Assembly, the, the greatest period was the beginning part because when I became speaker, the constitutional reform proposals had just been completed. And there were two areas which was, were of importance. One, we had to pass the laws to amend the constitution. Those were not tremendously controversial because both parties had agreed to them. Prior to, yeah, to, at, the, at, the level, at the commission at, level. At the commission level. So when the laws were drafted and passed, there was little, um, little uh, contradiction. The Constitutional Reform Commission had also recommended certain um, reforms in relation to parliamentary practice. They recommended certain um, parliamentary commissions to be established. Mm -hmm. In order to establish those commissions, to get them going, we had to um, pass re draft resolutions, get them agreed to and passed. That was a very challenging period and you had to get the collaboration of the, of the opposition. I drove that process. I was kind of oversaw and was responsible for that. In fact, I drafted the resolution. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a challenging time to get them agreed and accepted, but all of them were accepted. And the other aspect was to establish the commissions. You know, before we had we drafted the resolutions, the government and the opposition had to agree on the structure of these commissions, on their composition. Mm -hmm. uh, you may, may or may not remember that uh, the then leader of the opposition, Desmond Hoyt, had insisted that the government should have, um, the opposition should have, um, one issue was who should chair the commissions. Yes. Another issue was whether ministers should be on the commissions or not. Now, these were very thorny issues, but eventually agreement was reached. And um, the resolutions were drafted, were agreed to, and were passed in the National Assembly. That, that I believe, was... Those th people have forgotten that, of course, but mm -hmm. it was a very challenging era, and I was very, very happy with the outcome of all of that. I was very sad to see that during the period of 2011 and 2015, the, um, there was absolutely no kind of engagement between the government and the opposition to pass anything. But in that early period, the, the first parliament that I uh, presided over, 2001 to 2006, um, saw a great many improvements. The question, you, you raised this question about ministers sitting um, on, on, on these committees and commissions. 
Now, we all know, and, and I hope this is not too technical for the viewers, this whole question of separation of powers, which is that the state is made up of essentially of three arms, the executive, the legislative, and the um, judiciary, and that they shouldn't encroach on each other. Uh, the U.S. and the French claim to have pretty strict rules of separation of power. We don't have separation of power here. Although we talk, we have separation of power only in relation to the judiciary, it appears. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, in relation to the parliament, parliament and the executive, legislature and the executive. It's not as strong as it should be. The, because the executive sits in the parliament. Yes. I, I, well, <laughs> it's terribly weak because in this case you have 26 yeah. ministers. Yeah, well, one of the problems when we were discussing whether ministers should be in the committees or not yes. was the fact that all the ministers in the government, well, most of the um, MPs from the government side were ministers. Yes. So yeah. the number of MPs to sit on committees was very limited. Mm -hmm. But um, eventually they, that was got around that. So when, when we talk about separation of powers, it's a highly qualified concept it's hi in practice here. Highly qualified in the Westminster system. Yes. In the, you, recently I saw on the news one of the, um, one of the senators, a Republican senator, I don't recall his name at the moment, telling President Trump that I don't work for you. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the... Um, one of the two senators, Corker, Senator Corker, and, uh, and another senator, one of is one of those two who who uh, who, um, who they're resigning, they're yes, retiring. Yes, yes. They said to, to President Trump, "I don't work for you." So, can you imagine that happening here? Well, that's the level of of separation, separation of that exists elsewhere. Talking about Westminster. Um, in 1971, we severed our connections with the Privy Council. And last year, I think you went up to argue a case in Trinidad, from Trinidad yeah, yes. to the um, Privy Council? This year, June. Was it this year? June the 24th, yes. Yeah. What was that experience like, Rob? Oh, it was a wonderful experience, a marvelous experience. Both from the time I was consulted yes, and I was told because the Appellant was a friend. I was told by you the represented appellant. the appellant, or you? Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I was told by the appellant that I have to represent him. He doesn't have money to retain a British QC, mm -hmm. so, so I was drawn into it, and all the preparation and and and, and, and so on was completely new to me. Uh, and I was on not the principal. The principal was uh, the Solomon and Preston. No, so the legal the legal principles pr was not a problem. Yes, but the um, the preparation and the nerves. Uh, the, I was mm. nervous. I was. On I must say you didn't you didn't show it. Well, by the time you get up and you stand up talking, uh, it, the nerves kind of. And it's away. a fairly relaxed atmosphere. There's not it, it is this wigs and all of this. It, no, you you wear no formal. No um, formal court the dress. The lawyers don't even dre dress with gowns. When no, you appeared, you did no, not wear no, a gown. No, no, And you know, no wigs, no robes, and you can, the judges wear shirts of very bright colors. Yes. Some of them, uh, because I had been looking on the internet to, to, to sit things <laughs> before, <laughs> before I went up, so that I can know what to expect. And you see judges with red ties and striped red shirts and all kind of colors. Um, here you have to wear formal colors still. Should we abolish that nonsense? Is, is that well, not nonsense? Well, is is that some in, glory and majesty? It's, but it's, it's, I, I would have no objection that for robes to be abolished. Um, and now, now in fact, we, we seem to be wanted to, to move where you have what, what you call bibs or what? what Yes. Or cleats, what are they called? Uh, yes, the bibs they call them. I don't know what's the formal name, but they're used in Trinidad. I see no reason for that here. Um, but Tell me, wh what exactly, wh where does this word speaker come from? Because in, in the proper course of, of a, 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 hair, a session of the parliament, the speaker should be the one who speaks least. Yes, the speaker was the person who, in, in ancient times, uh, was nominated. 
by the members of the commons mm -hmm. to go and intervene with the, with the sovereign or the sovereign's representatives to mm -hmm. speak on behalf of the members. And that's where it came from. It was a dangerous job. I mean, people lost their heads for that. <laughs> Nine speakers were executed. Thank goodness. That has <laughs> never happened here. <laughs> they, they recently, we have seen the speaker, the, the, the current speaker, um, who appears to have taken a very activist kind of role in the in the National Assembly and what can be discussed and what cannot be discussed. What should be the role of the speaker in terms of the agenda, the, the order of business and all these matters? Well, uh, I can only speak of what, well, the, the speaker is the final arbiter of the what goes on the order paper. And the order paper is the agenda of the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. um, so motions and questions have to be approved by him uh, so that he has a final deciding role. Now, it depends on how the speaker operates. M questions, they, they all come to the speaker eventually, but yes. they come with a recommendation. Yes. They all come with a recommendation from the clerk's office. Not mm -hmm. necessarily the clerk, the clerk, well, the clerk stamp of approval. But they come from his office with a recommendation whether this should be accepted or rejected or whether the question should be, should be altered or a recommendation made for it to be altered and, and whether a motion um, is acceptable or not. Speaker doesn't have to accept the clerk's recommendation. Mm -hmm. He can make his own decision. So that's how it operated in my time. Uh, I don't know how it operates. But so. we're talking about the constitution with which you yourself operated, uh, um, mm -hmm. because we've had very few. We've had constitutional changes for a long while. Yeah. Now, if we were to take this constitution, Diana is a democratic sovereign state known as the Republic of Diana. Uh, that's Article 1, democratic, meaning of the people, by the people, for the people, as a popular conception. And Article 9 says sovereignty belongs to the people who exercise it through their representatives and the democratic organs established by or under this constitution. Why should a member who is elected within a, a democratic framework, as our constitution, Article 1 really, in my view, is the most important article in this constitution. Why should an unelected person tell an elected person, look, you can't raise this matter in the House? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> the elected members <laughs> have decided. You see, the country has, has approved, technically speaking, the Constitution is a document which guides all of us, has been approved by the yes, country, yes. either directly or through, the, through yes. the National Assembly. And it's the absolute supreme law. Yes. It and binds everybody. And the Constitution provides that a speaker can be an elected member or an, a non-elected yes, yes. member. And is elected by the National Assembly mm -hmm. at its first sitting. Yes. So they have given him that right. No, but no, 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 the, no, no, no. He, he given the right to be the speaker yeah. and to regulate the Regulate the business of Parliament according to the standing orders. No, no, we go here. The standing orders are not law. They have no status in law. They guide the business of the National Assembly. But the, the, the law is the Constitution. And it's the, the member ought to be free to discuss and to raise issues. But if that happens, you'll have chaos. In, in the, in the, well, the members can be free to do whatever they No, want. but they must be free to bring up motions or to... to yeah, but the motions have to comply with the standing orders. The speaker is obliged under the standing orders to uh, reject certain motions, certain, no, motions, but, certain but, but, issues but, but, cannot but be... But you're discussed. saying, what is implicit there, uh, Mr. Rampurant, 
is that you have an unelected person operating under something that is not even law, let alone the supreme law. Well, but the justice's view is that it's not law. I'm not too sure that that's correct. But that is the position. Uh, uh, that's the position at the moment. That's the chief. Ian Chang's view w w ruled that. And um, that has not been overruled. So that remains the, the legal position. Well. But, but no, no, there's. if you were to look at the definition of law yeah, but in the Constitution. Yeah, but the Constitution provides for standing orders. Yes. So standing orders are approved by the National Assembly. The members of the National Assembly approve the standing orders and say that we agree to be guided by these standing orders. And the speaker is elected to, ob to manage the business of the National Assembly under the rules as provided for in the standing orders, uh, well, required to. I think, uh, but but I, I keep saying Article 9, mm. so, this whole business of the sovereignty, yeah. where you want to discuss something. I mean, we've had, you've, you've heard issues of, of sugar, the, mm. the, the, um, the, the bonus, yes. where you have, um, from all accounts, yeah. that the Minister of Finance yeah. has presented flawed estimates to the National Assembly. Yeah. This is a serious matter. Yeah, but nothing stops. I, I read in the newspapers, the members of the, the opposition member, one opposition member, moved an adjournment motion to discuss the bonus issue. Mm -hmm. The speaker uh, rejected the motion. The motion. Now, there, nothing stops the opposition from tabling a motion to be heard in the ordinary way, to discuss the the, the um, to discuss the bonus, what they didn't get was an emergency debate, but there's nothing to stop them from tabling a motion the, to have a regular the, the, debate. The Constitution also provides for members' days, and we have not been having we not we've not been having those. Um, what impact you think that has? What effect does that have? on a proper administration of the National Assembly, which is supposed to be the democratic voice of the people. Well, as far as members' days are concerned, I read in the newspapers that there was a complaint that members' days were not being held, uh, that Parliament was not being held on members' days. And the clerk gave an explanation. I can't quite recall what he said, but among the things he said was that on one specific members' day, there was no member's business. Mm -hmm. So, but that was a problem even when I was speaker, mm -hmm. that there were members' days, but there was no member's business. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing to was discuss. The job, was the job, was the, the role of the speaker then in that case? Should, should, he, should he be be saying, look, you know, we have this provision. Uh, let's make use of it. Because the speaker is in an excellent position. If you look at the, the hierarchy, the speaker comes what? Four? Uh, Something you have like the, that. the president, the prime minister, the chancellor, and I think the next in line is the speaker. Yeah, yeah. In order of, order of precedence. Yeah. So that's a pretty serious position, unelected position. Yeah. Shouldn't there be more responsibility devolving on the speaker? I mean, look, we had just prior to the debate, you had 320 days in the calendar. The National Assembly had only met 16 times. That's one out of 20 days. That's almost a meaningless body now. <laughs> it meets to, to discuss budget, which you know is going to be passed. Yeah. Dear, look, the, I, I don't know what, what goes on now, and I can't speak for, for, for the business now, but that was a concern during the time when I was there. And we gave several annual reports to show the amount of time the Parliament met, the number of issues they, they were dealt with. We gave annual reports like every other government department. Uh, and, and, um, and that kind of thing. But we tried to encourage members to raise issues in the National Assembly, both privately 
and in the National Assembly itself. But, you know, it's the problem. I can't speak for members of the National Assembly, but one issue that we confront in Guyana is that members of parliament do not earn enough to, uh, to be full-time members of parliament. They have to have a second job, which makes it very difficult for members to keep the assembly going with motions and issues uh, 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 all the time. That's a reality that we have to face. But if unless, unless you pay members of parliament to, have the, to devote themselves exclusively to the job of parliament, then these problems will continue. But surely, and, and you yourself, and, and I think you submitted yourself for, for political office at some point, you know what is involved. You can't know what is involved when you go there and say, look, you know, this, I ain't getting enough money, I can't do my job. <laughs> That's a breach of faith. That's true, yeah, I agree with you. That, that's, that's very much true. There's but some members who were very diligent and worked very hard, I must confess. But You know, and you do have lots of members of the National Assembly who are paid out of the public purse by virtue of being ministers, by virtue of being some commission head or something like that. So to say that they're not being paid is not quite accurate. I'm, I'm not challenging what you say. I'm challenging what they're saying. Yeah, ministers are paid quite substantially. Especially now. <laughs> Especially now, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but surely, 16 times out of 320 is unacceptable. I, I wasn't aware of the figures, but I accept what you say. And yeah, to me that, that's not a lot of meeting, no. The, on, on this question of... In Guyana, Guyana, we have to understand the history is... The history is that the government drives the National Assembly. That's the history. It can't suddenly change from the members driving the National Assembly. A lot of changes have to take place. When you say but suddenly, though, Ralph, what do you mean by suddenly? I mean, we've been independent now 51 years. Yes, but up to, to, up, 52 up, years, up to yesterday, it's the government business that drives the National Assembly. Members of the National Assembly historically have not played a driving role, a moving role. Committees don't meet frequently. Committees don't present reports to the National Assembly for debating, even though the committees exist. Even though there's a, we left, and I think it still exists, a strong committees department of the National Assembly to service committees. The committees don't report. So, Unless the government drives the meetings of the National Assembly, it's not going to improve in any way. It's government business that moves the National Assembly. Well, if, if, if Speaker's Day, it's supposed to be once a month or something like that? What? This, uh, sorry, not Speaker's Day, members. Day, Member's Day. I think so, yes. Uh -huh. So that should have come for 12 days. Members don't have, don't always have business. That's, the, that's another problem. Is this list system the, 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 the bane of our it's not democratic the list, system? It's not the list system. Well, because anybody, you, you, anybody get, get, some leader of the list pulls names of people regardless of their, their competence. Yeah, but, or but the, when members go, when you have first pass the post, it's the leadership of the party that chooses the candidate for each area. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's but not at any least different. the at least the elector in that case, though, Ralph, knew who they were voting for. Yes, they knew if this person wins um, a majority or a plurality, this person goes into the national assembly. At the moment, you've got sixty-five, and and it's like a lotto. Yeah, but you, you don't, don't know who, who you don't know who represent you. It's not clear who represents you. That's true. And even with the 25, because we have 40... Um, 40 top up. Top up. 25 constituencies. Yeah. You don't even know who your constituency is. Yeah, that's true. Because the constituencies are too large. You're ten, the constituents, constituencies are the 10 regions. Mm -hmm. And some regions have two members, some have three, some have one. And so I think true. in the case of regions, region four, it has seven. Yeah, four has seven. 
but surely that should be fairly easy to fix. It's very easy to fix, but the political parties have not seen, have not had the will to fix it. The Constitution Reform Commission in 2000, in, in 2000 recommended that the system be converted and pointed out that the laws already exist in the Constitution for an act of parliament to be passed, providing for half the system of half the number of seats to be passed by a proportional mm -hmm. representation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, my point to you is this. We have 65 seats of the National Assembly. Yes. The last elections in Guyana in first past the post in 1961 had 32 constituencies. Mm -hmm. According to the Constitution, you can only have half of the 65, which would be 32 or 33, mm -hmm. elected by force past the post. Yes. I'm suggesting, therefore, it's not a difficult matter to have agreement between the two parties because you have a basis, you have a template yes. of 1961 mm -hmm. in which you can yes. begin to work. When uh, shortly after the Constitutional Reform Commission, I urged the People's Progressive Party and they to provide a motion on the National Assembly to pass a law, a motion to adopt the recommendation of the Constitutional Reform Commission and to enact legislation to implement Mm -hmm. that proposal. The, the motion came to the Parliament. Before it was debated, the opposition said that the motion must go to, um, the PUP wanted the motion to go to one committee and the opposition wanted it to go to another committee to discuss, refer to the standing committee, and that's where it ended. I suggested privately to Ramatar, to, sorry, to former President Ramatar and to Mr. Vincent Alexander, who was leading the PNC, that let us have a joint committee to examine it. And it never happened. So efforts were made. And the PVP didn't want it. The PVP didn't want the motion. After it was fire, after it was after it was tabled and it became known, <laughs> um, not everybody knew or not everybody considered the import or the effect or importance of the motion. After it occurred to some people mm -hmm. what it would have meant, uh, they withdrew their support and the motion fell apart. The, the, the PNC didn't cooperate, so the whole thing fell apart. You talked about the will to fix it. Uh, how would you describe the political culture? You, you've been, you've, you, you were born into a political family. Our political culture, as I've grown to understand and learn over the years, and which I did not realize when I was an active politician, <clears throat> our political culture is based on the culture of our country. Our country is really two countries under one roof. We're two nations. We're Africans and we're Indians. Nations yeah. or tribes? Well, <laughs> however you want to put it. No, I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> there are others involved, like the mixed population and Amerindians. But effectively, it's the Indians and the Africans who determine the normal culture which drives the political culture. The normal culture is that these two nations are in competition with each other all the time, every day, every single day. That, does, that doesn't mean that you have families who work hard, don't bother with anybody else, have regular friends across the spectrum, 
sometimes. It is said that, that and, that's that holds until the date of elections. <laughs> well, no, but it does not it does not detract from the fundamental culture of Guyana as a so society that is in competition b b where the two major races are in competition with each other and that derived competition for dominance mm -hmm. it's a competition for dominance dominance social so because economic and every kind of dominance and that drives the political culture which is the culture for dominance because if you have political dominance then you get economic, cultural, social. So it is believed. It doesn't really happen, of course. But that's the belief system that we have here in Guyana. And that is what drives the... the to what extent, then, would you say that that culture sounds more like a subculture, accounts for the state of our development over the, the 51 years of our independence? Well, looking at the current situation now would tell you. We have a political party in government that thinks it will win elections. It promised constitutional reform, which would have introduced a power-sharing mechanism. They think they will win the elections, so they have no interest in implementing that, uh, that promise. The opposition thinks they will win the elections, so they have no interest in constitutional reform. And every, every era you go into, whenever this government, whenever APNU plus AFC or APNU alone is out of the government, it will happen at some time in the future. When they go out of government and the PBPC comes into government, the positions will be reversed. And so we will go on. Unless unless the people themselves make demands for the changes. How? Demands which are irresistible. How can those demands, the, the kinds of demands in a political context, generally, and you, you've observed history, generally it means putting public pressure on governments. Yeah. That's not likely to happen. Well, I don't say it's not, I wouldn't say it's not likely to happen. I say we have to continue the work of, uh, of, of that many people are doing, um, writing, talking, and so on, and build up public opinion. Well, but, but as you said, public opinion is colored or discolored by that house that is divided, right, in, in itself. Yeah, but... Things, things change, you know, things, things, things change. Looking at things in 2017, by how much have things in fact changed in terms of that political culture that you just described? The, the opposition feels it's going to get into power, it doesn't want too many changes. The government feels it never is going to lose, it doesn't want changes. There's some talk about what can happen in a day, sometimes uh, what doesn't happen in a hundred years happens in a day. <laughs> you know? Yeah, well. Look, the fact that, the fact, when I was a young man, my ambition was to bring socialism to Guyana. There was no, nothing in front of me that suggested that this was likely to happen soon. Mm -hmm. But that didn't mean that I would not work towards achieving my ambition. Mm -hmm. The fact that ending the culture of ethno-political dominance does not appear to be immediately achievable does not mean that I will stop arguing for it mm -hmm. or fighting for it. And I am confident that the day will come sometime in the future, I can't say when, when the people of Guyana will realize 
that the political system has to change before Guyana enjoys the maximum benefits of its wealth and opportunity. Does it worry you that the major changes that have taken place in Guyana, and let's look at them, 1964, and leading to proportional representation, uh, 64 following, 1971-73, 1980s or 78-80, 1997, these changes have been brought about largely through not political dialogue and civilized discussion, but in fact debts and suspension of democratic norms. That, that's part of the characteristic and the tradition of Guyana. Well, that that, that would you dispute my my my? No, no, I'm not. I will not dispute what you're saying. But changes sometimes come from convulsion. Look at Zimbabwe. Changes sometimes come sometimes come from social and political upheavals. Sometimes, mm -hmm. not all the time. Sometimes. Now. There, there's so much of this view that, look, we've tried all of these things, and nothing is changing. The government's own figures said that 18,000 persons, the net migration, in 2017, 2016, I think, is 18,000 people. That's massive. Oh, well, people will start with that. No, no. Start returning when? When the oil starts to flow. <laughs> well, listen, the way people's expectations, the way stock markets, you don't wait for the actual event. You, you, just the announcement, an announcement of oil should have been the transformational moment. People are leaving. How do you, how do you explain that? Well, in, in, in larger numbers. That's almost unprecedented. Well, people don't see a future here because one of the reasons is the political problems. The second reason is the family family ties overseas. Uh, lots and lots of people have left Guyana, and they're taking their families with them, and they don't see any immediate prospect of improvement. So, well, no, but you just mentioned oil. Well, when the oil starts to flow and... Um, more funds become available and people, I'm not Guyanese, I'm, so, I'm not saying Guyanese will, will return, but I envisage um, migration to Guyana will, 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 will come from somewhere, either returning Guyanese, preferably of course, or others. You mentioned oil and you mentioned funds. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm sure it wasn't. <laughs> it might have been entirely coincidental. Stabuk News carried an editorial a couple of days ago. Your favorite newspaper. Um, or we, both, we both write for the Stabuk News. <laughs> yes, it did. Um, the first occasion on which any significant amount, let's not say is the first money from oil, mm -hmm. because obviously. People paid for licenses, etc. Before the first significant sum was concealed, the public accounts were incorrect, and that's putting it kindly. The constitution was violated. What kind of confidence? does that inspire? Very little confidence. I, I think it was a very bad decision. Uh, I've said so myself. It was a very bad decision, very unwise decision. And in this day and age, these things cannot be concealed. It was very wrong. It was a very wrong thing to do. And it shattered the confidence that a lot of people had that transparency and accountability will improve. This government went in opposition for the past four years, for the four years between 2011 and 2015. That was their biggest issue, 
transparency and accountability. And the first opportunity they got, the, um, they, 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 they missed the bus. The first opportunity they got, they, they fell down. And um, I'm very sad and unhappy about it. And in fact, that unlawfulness continues. It should be corrected. There's no doubt that it's unlawful, but it can be corrected by doing the right thing, going to Parliament, uh, making the um, making the information available, and so what, on. What does it say when it's so patently unlawful, but the, we are told by the president, oh, the court has to tell me to do it before I do it? Well, uh, that's wrong. I mean, that cannot be defended. What the president has announced cannot be defended. It's patently wrong, and it should be corrected. You talk about the what has the kind of expectations and promises. The Alliance for Change and the, the, the leaders, two of the three, um, Ram Karan and Nagamoto. Um, sorry, Ram Jatan. Sorry. You'd be horrified that you mistake me for him. I think he after should. our recent exchanges in the press, <laughs> <laughs> I think he should be pleased. <laughs> you should be. Uh, yes, they were very gung ho about the same matters you talked about: transparency and accountability, and lambasting Jagdeo on, 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 on his corruption and and their finale. Um, not without um, merit. Yeah. How have they stood up by, it, by the standards that they themselves it, had? It's very had. sad to see that they now defend these things. They might say that something is wrong, um, but generally speaking, they defend these things. And when I call them to book, I was subject to abuse by Ramzatan. Oh, yes, yes, um, yes. You know, the the the. AFC has uh, completely lost all credibility. And when you um, point it out to them, to, to those who the AFC believed that I had a hand in, 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 in bringing them to power. Um, That's a great praise, isn't it? Well, uh, uh, as I mentioned in, in, in my article in response to Mr. Ram, Minister Ramjitan, when he met me after the elections, he embraced me and, and you know, thank Minister, Prime Minister Nagabu to thank me. So, so should I not, if I brought help to bring them to power, should I not criticize them when I, I feel that they're well, I, I, I think on the wrong I road? think you probably have greater standing, but everybody has a right and in fact, a duty yeah. to criticize persons when they're going wrong and acting against the national interest. I cannot understand what, what, what caused the viciousness of Kim Raji's response to me. It is. Did you call him to ask him? I didn't call him, no. It was highly unusual because what I suggest was not personal. They probably believed that it was personal, tampering with their livelihood or something. But it was a political posture which I felt they should adopt. Resign from the government and sit down in the back benches and prod the government from the back benches. Don't bring down the government. Prod the government from the back benches. And I think that they, they cannot be happy with the lack of success that they are having as members of the coalition. They cannot be happy with it. You, uh, you've been a politician for a lot of your life. Do you honestly believe Moses Nagamoto really cares about that or he cares about it? He's more interested in the trappings of his office and the comfort and the perks that he derives from those from the office. Well, I would want to believe that while the trappings are important for him and the perks and all of that are important for, for him, I would want to believe that above and beyond that, are is are a, 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 a wish to accomplish 
uh, many of the things that he set out. Well, yeah, but, but from what you've seen, from what you've seen, and I don't want this to be about Nagamoto. Um, this yeah, but for the AFC, I, I think from, the AFC. No, from what you've seen about Nagamoto, do you, do you think he, he cares about those high uh, ideological and democratic standards? All I can say is that I hope he does. Oh, okay. I hope he does. All right. <laughs> You should be in diplomacy. <laughs> <laughs> now, the AFC came in as a third force. It had held itself out to be the balance, that it would never join A or B, that if it did, it would be dead meat, I think, it, um, to use your friend Ramjatan's words. Do you think the conduct of the AFC, and not only Ramjatan and Nagamoto, but Trotman and David Patterson, and, and Noel Hola. Um, do you think that party has, has done harm to this idea of a third party holding some kind of balance in this country? It has completely destroyed the faith of people in Guyana who see the building of a third force as a means towards achieving some impact on the dismantling of the ethno political dominance that pervades our political system. The idea was exactly what the AFC achieved. You get a balance. The PVP has 49% and the APNU would, would have had, had it not been the AFC, its usual 40 to 42%. Mm -hmm. And the AFC would have been in the middle. The answer would have been this is our manifesto. Which one of you will implement it? And we will support that political party which will implement the manifesto. Or at least implement on, on, on issues that are, are in, on an issue by issue basis. On an issue by issue basis. And there, that is what I think the people who supported the AFC wanted to see. And they have completely destroyed that concept. It will be very difficult for another group of people to come to the electorate, say the same thing, and be trusted by that electorate or by the people who previously supported the AFC. As a lawyer, you've seen a lot of issues um, being litigated, the, the government losing a number of cases. Um, you've seen the president, for example, in that case relating to GCOM, where he was supposed to give reason. He just ignored it and he said, well, his chief justice has our views, I think. Is that the word he used? Yes. And he has his. Yeah. Is that responsible? Is that the, when, the, when the court speaks, it, does the court, is the court giving a, a, a is that a view? It's not a view. The, the president, I think the president has not repeated that, that, that kind of thing. And he has said that he will observe the decisions of the court. I'm not sure that the Chief Justice said, said that this is a requirement. She did. She did say yes. that, that yes. reasons must that are reasons. a requirement. Must give reasons, yes. Okay. Well, he, he's required to follow the decision. But he hasn't. If he does, he well, hasn't. Well, if he ignores the decision of the Chief Justice, then the court will overrule now, him. Well, now, this is interesting. The Bar Association was a party to that action. Yeah. And would you say the Bar Association has really followed through on that issue? Should it have then taken this issue and said, look, this has to be done? Could be. I, I, I haven't, um, even though the president and I sit a door away, <laughs> I, I can't say that I've followed the issue with any um, carefulness. But, but no, but you, you would expect you, you, your legal profession, forget yeah. about it, your legal profession, yeah. to, to, to promote and advocate 
and almost insists on the observance of decisions by the court, especially speaking on constitutional I would, issues. I would think so, yes. The Bar Association has a very important role to play on in these matters. Does it surprise you then that it hasn't? Or does it disappoint you? And, well, I, I suppose. I don't know what's the reason. Um, that they, 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 there must be some uh, there must be some reason that they haven't followed through in on it. One also has to understand that the Bar Association is a is a operates in a m political milieu of some of some of some. Um, but 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 Ralph, some you know, the Bar Association was at its best when it was operating in one of the most restrictive. And undemocratic. I was an Bar Association time. executive for that entire decade, and yes, Ashton it, Chase, and yes, it was. Patrick, Peter and, Britton. And yes, it was. Yes, it was. But the situation is a bit different now. Well, what's the situation? Well, we don't have a dictatorship now. The 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 we had a so PNC, therefore you ought to be able to speak. We had a PNC dictatorship, and there was great unity in the legal profession, even though there were many people who were supporters of of the PNC. There, there is an organization rise. You, you, you would have seen it. I've read about it. In yes, um, they're trying to advocate for the return to first past the post. Is that is that a is that a realistic? That's not realistic. We have a system, as I explained, as we discussed earlier. There is a system in the constitution that will bring back first past the post, and will keep the um, the overall proportionality. proportionality of the electorate. That's the best system. That's what that's we need. That's a good blend. That's, in that's, a, a good that's the perfect system for us. Nobody will lose, and everybody will gain, including the people of Guyana. We talked um, about the constitution and the drafting. How come we ended up in this mess? Whether the constitution allows a third term or not a third term. Should we have been a little bit more explicit in that matter? Um, well, it's not the drafting. It's the, it's, I haven't read the decision of the Court of sure. Appeals. So I don't know what, I'll try to get it without success. Um, it's not the drafting. It's the, it's the, um, it's the question, it's how it was passed in the National Assembly. It was said that it needs a, a, a referendum, and I can't figure. No, the, no, no, I can't no. figure out the reasoning. This is about whether the president has is allowed to go for a third term. That's what it is. Well, I don't know. I I only know what Justice Chief Justice Chang had said. I am on. I have been unable to get a copy of the Constitution from the librarian of the Court of Appeal. The Constitution. Sorry, a copy of the Court of Appeal decision. I promise you that you will get a copy from me tomorrow. Good, okay, thank yes. you. Now, we talked about your career and your, your long span in politics. Mm. Have you withdrawn and retired from active politics? I have withdrawn and retired from active politics. If you were to be offered, um, look, we, we, we need to... Uh, is, is that irreversible? And a irrevocable? return to active politics? Yes. If I were to be offered a return to active politics? Yes. <laughs> that's, a, that's highly speculative. That's the first thing. Second thing, I'm not likely to be offered. Um, um, age is catching up with me. Uh, All, of us. <laughs> All of us. All of us. So I don't anticipate any such thing. I don't consider it. I don't contemplate it. I don't think about it. And I have no desire to sit down in meetings and do what I've been doing for the past 50 years. I really would cringe at having to do any such thing. As you look back on your life in politics, you, you, as you said, you had great ups. You no doubt have had some serious disappointments. Yeah. Would you say the dedication that you've given to it has been matched by the progress we have made? In other words, was it really 
effectively worth it? I, it, I think it is worth it. The biggest thing was the return to democracy in India and the restoration of democracy. I think that's the most important thing, and that's what we have to defend, nurture, and defend, and ensure that it continues. I think the re return of democracy to Ghana was worth all the struggle that we, we got. And we must continue to fight to protect it. The president, Mr. David Granger, made a very um, encouraging statement recently. Um, that he will not preside over rigged elections. Well, of course, he doesn't preside over elections, yeah. but uh, it's, a, it's a popular use mm -hmm. of the word. What do you think, what guarantees or what steps would you want to see? I think you were in, you were in GCOM as well. Oh, for a You've long time. You've been on many, many things many, in this yes. country, yes. What is necessary? Given the, the experiences with Justice James Patterson and the manner of his own appointment, the unilateral appointment, what kind of undertakings and guarantees would you like to see that you think are necessary to support President Granger's um, very noble statement that he would not present? I would, like to, I would like to see two things. Strict compliance and cooperation by the government with the implementation of all the advances which have been made so far in compiling the list and all these things. And on election day, ensuring that every political party is allowed to field agents at polling places mm -hmm. and the protection of that a those agents with adequate security. We have seen what has happened in the city uh, more than once. That should not happen again. Those are the two things I would like to see happen. Um, how do you go about that? How do you, how do you get it happening? Well, we, uh, you get it happening by asking the um, foreign observers to ensure that asking the government, pointing out what has happened in the past, and pointing out the potential flaws in the electoral process, and building public opinion to ensure that it happens. You said, and this is uh, my last comment before I make a comment, uh, last question before I make a comment, that you wanted to bring socialism as a youth, and uh, as so many of us you know, youths wanted to do. Um, do you still feel a, a, a leaning towards socialism? Well, I, I still, <laughs> I support, I support, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm on the liberal and progressive left, uh, politically. Have always been, I will, uh, I imagine, expect I will remain there. In terms of Guyana's politics and the politics of, of our, our region, I am happy with the, with, with the way we are going. We understand the social needs of the country. Both political parties have committed to um, developing those social needs and to build the country uh, with a market economy. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it. Well, in that, you share the same values of your friends, your Israel friends, Ramjatan and Nagamoto. Yeah. yeah. So you're, the, you're in good company. They're, they're more, they're in political terms, they're more pro-American, so to speak. I see. And, and, uh, I, I'm not that I'm anti-American or that I'm pro-Russian or anybody else, but they are uncritically yes. pro-American. I mean, I would, I, would be, I, would be, I would be very happy to see how the government will vote when they, um, in the UN General Assembly on the, on the Jerusalem, Jerusalem issue. issue. With the warning from Trump, we're we'll watching, we'll we'll watching you. With the warning from we'll Trump. Yeah. Mr. Ralph Ramkran, I want to thank you very much. It's been a very um, pleasant uh, but informative one-hour discussion. You were worried about the, um, whether we would survive. We probably both have survived, <laughs> even if just. So <laughs> thank you again. Thank and you I wish much. you and your family Good. very Merry Christmas, thank prosperous you. New Year. Same and our present viewers, <laughs> thank you very much and good night. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs>